Hello and good evening, or good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. My name is Keith Anthony Taylor. This is London Overcomers Real Pain. I'm very happy to have with me these two happy smiling people, hypnotist John Sabone, the trance master, and his friend Dr. Connie Hambrook, uh, America's fertility coach. And it's we're going to have um, a great discussion, I'm sure. It's going to be very free form. We have no agenda. Hypnotist John Sabone has created 93 ways of putting you into a uh, rapid trance or instant trance. I, I, I always get confused between the two, but I'm sure that during this hour, John will explain the difference between rapid and instant trance. Will, will you do that for us, John? Absolutely. And I'm thinking that we're probably going to get some fertility coaching from uh, Dr. Connie Hambrook. And you're also a hypnotist, aren't you, Dr. Connie? I am. Uh-huh. And that's wonderful. So we're going to be tips on um, hypnosis, I'm sure. And yes. John, John, you're you're getting ready to go to Las Vegas, aren't you, for the Hypnothoughts Convention? Yes, Connie and I will be out there. I'll be teaching a four-hour class called John Sabone's Galaxy of Hypnosis. I'll be talking for four hours about everything to make your private session better, your speed inductions better, your show better. I. As people might or might not know about me, I invented a self-hypnosis technique when I was three years old. I had a dad who screamed a lot. I'm sure nobody has anything in common about that. And um, I used to go upstairs and lay down on the bed and deep breathe and put myself into what turned out to be hypnosis. My parents thought that was strange until I turned five, and they said, teach us how to do that. So I was doing what turned out to be hypnosis training at five years old. And then um, kids in grammar school, high school, and college that were thinking about running away from home I was working with them. Um, I didn't know them well, but they would just somehow find me and say, help me. And I would ask them to close their eyes and I would work with them. And when they popped their eyes open, they didn't want to run away or do terrible things. Uh, run away, some cases in high school or college, talking about suicide. And all of a sudden, the dispositions changed. So I actually feel like I was born to do this. You know, I mean, and I've continued to take training. I hold 40 something certifications and awards and sort of things. And I've worked really, really hard to elevate everything I do to the next level. So I've written four clinical books in hypnosis. The third book, the first, second, and fourth are script books about what suggestions to read. The third book is called Power Hypnosis, The Future of Hypnotic Sessions. And that book is basically how to think like a hypnotist and how to write like a hypnotist. So I've written all these different techniques. I've come up with all kinds of ideas. I'm shooting for 100 inductions. So far, I have two more that are verbal. And actually, if I need to hypnotize somebody verbally, I just make it up. But also, too, I love doing the shows. So I'm kind of like a whole plethora of hypnotists mixed together. And um, on Monday at HT Live out there, I'll be teaching uh, a one-day class on speed trance hypnosis, putting people into hypnosis in seconds or even faster than that. Some of the inductions are split seconds. And I've I've seen a lot of them, and I've learned a lot of them, and, and you, I think you forgot to mention the DVDs that you do, because I've got lots of your DVDs. Oh, you're the one. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, basically, I have a lot of stuff now on instant downloads. I found with shipping product overseas, like to other continents, a lot of the stuff gets tied up in customs or it gets lost. So many of those videos are now instantly downloadable. And something else that Connie has helped me put together is this. These are going to be C, not, they're not CDs. They're basically flash drives with loads MP3s. of MP3s, mm -hmm. MP3s for hypnotists. One thing I find hypnotists don't do is have all the hypnotists hypnotize them. So this is part of a program I'm putting together. And she and I worked this up together with my stuff. And um, we will be selling hypnosis for hypnotists out there because we need it too. Yes, I, I've hypnotized um, a lot of hypnotists myself. I, I don't, I don't know why they they come to me to be hypnotized, but they won't hypnotize me for some reason. And I, I would, love to be, I would love to be hypnotized because it, it's just some that's always escaped me, oh, and I, <laughs> I think that's very unfair. <laughs> John and I that. can help you with that. Yes, we can. <laughs> that will that will be great because I've I've yet to experience that that deep level of hypnosis, and which, which is a bit unfair because i've i've hypnotized myself I've, I've even i've been even in surgery you know having surgical procedures done on me using hypnosis and, and that was that was and that was and, and that, that was an exhilarating experience because when when you walk towards a, a surgical theater door 
and it's still closed. And you walk towards that door and you think, am I doing the right thing? Because yeah. once you're on that table and you've said to the surgeon, you, you're, you're not going to have any anesthetic. And you wonder, am I really bluffing? Is this going to work? <laughs> and, 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 I, and I think that in itself gives you that, that level endorphin that's going to make it okay because the, the endorphin anesthetizes you, doesn't it? So even if the hypnosis doesn't work, I think the endorphin is going to work. So everything's okay. And it worked out, fortunately. And well, I, that's I, all part of hypnosis, though, yeah, using the endorphins. That's part yeah. of your brain, just letting everything yeah. come forward. And I, and I did that three times, and I was laughing all the way through all three times. And I think, wow. they, I think they thought I was insane. Yeah. And, and, and the look on their faces, I wish I had a camera just to get the expressions on their faces, because I think they were more scared than me. That's probably <laughs> true. Yeah. And, and they, it was good because they, um, they, I, I'm sure that they took a lot more care than they would have done if I was unconscious, because they I'm were sure. aware they were aware that there were witnesses, me, <laughs> were watching their every move. And it was fascinating to watch what they were doing. Yeah. And, and, and it was strange because years ago, I was absolutely terrified of everything to do with hospitals, needles, mm. doctors, because I've had some bad experiences in hospitals when I was a kid. Mm. But, but the wonderful thing with hypnosis and, and using the power of the mind, you can overcome anything including infertility. As, right. as, as I'm sure you, you could tell us, Connie. So perhaps, Connie, you could tell us a little bit about how you overcome infertility. Okay. Well, it depends on what's going on for the person. But the people that I see, for the most part, have a diagnosis of uh, not infertility as much as they say that they are idiopathic which just means that the doctor can't find a reason why they can't get pregnant. So basically they are well people who just haven't felt like they've been lucky enough to get pregnant. Yeah. So many times it has to do with stress, both the stress for the woman and for the man. I live right outside the, the gate, so to speak, of the, the capital of our nation, Washington, D.C. And it's a very stressful place for a lot of people. And if you are overstressed, then your sperm production goes down, your fallopian tubes for the woman close up. And so even if you could get the sperm in there, you can't get the eggs to fall where the sperm's gonna be getting to them. So to work with the couple to get them both to a place where they can get pregnant. So I, before COVID, I used to see them in my office. Now I see them virtually. And yes, you can hypnotize virtually as John does frequently. And so do I. And to be able to get people on the right page, you know, you, if you have two people that are going in different directions, it's difficult to get pregnant. You know, kind of like two dogs trying to go in different directions. Humans are the same way. You have to get them on the same page, going in the same direction. Yes, I, I can imagine it. It helps if the if the two people stand closer together. <laughs> or lay yeah. down, or stand up, or sit down. I don't know. Whatever helps. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> However, they're comfortable. <laughs> I, I, I always I always believe in in the collective consciousness, and because out here is a collective consciousness. Because you you and John and myself, we are communicating collectively through the collective consciousness and it's the same within the body all the cells in the body talk to each other and yep. that's why we get sick because right. we don't have the right kind of conversation going on in here Very and true. all the stress causes the body to get sick mm -hmm. but if we have the right conversation going on in here then all the body all the cells in the body are in harmony and they're in communication and i i do with, with me, in, instead of worrying about the cat, the dog, the budgie, the cooking, the, the, the bills and all that kind of stuff, I, I meditate throughout the day. I focus on my breathing and breathing in and out through my nose, which is good for you. And I send messages to my body telling my body to do maintenance all the day. So instead of running on a, a minimum set of instructions to, to make the heart beat and to make the kidneys work and to make the muscles move, I, I'm doing a complete body maintenance all the day. So all of the cells 
are looking to see if they're all communicating properly and doing good stuff. And it's the same, I imagine, with fertility. If it's everything's doing what it's supposed to do, uh, everything's in harmony, then we're going to get healthy babies popping out, aren't we? There you go. Yeah, I actually have both people in the couple separately draw pictures of a tree while they're thinking about the baby. And then there's a really great app that will help me read the tree to tell me what each person is thinking so that if they're not going in the same direction, I can talk to them about it and say, well, he thinks this way, you think this way. You know, which one of you wants to change the way you're thinking so that you can both create the same thing. And it really breaks the ice and it is the beginning of hypnofertility because it really lets me know where they are and lets them know where they are. Yes. I'm, I'm just, just looking that to, I'm sad that we're getting no comments coming in from anybody. And I, hope, I hope the people are actually getting the stream. I hope so too. I've just left a, I've just left a message in the chat box in Facebook, but um, maybe people, what, what is it? Um, it's Friday, isn't it? Yes, it's Friday. But, um, I'm, I'm sure they'll get it in the replay perhaps because it's two o'clock in New York, isn't it? Are, are you in New York, yep. um, Connie? No, I'm in Virginia. Virginia, that sounds so lovely. It's the same time, 11 mm -hmm. after 2. That's northwest of um, New York, isn't it, Virginia? No, that's southwest of New York. Okay. What do I know? <laughs> it's okay. So, so I actually um, have a written technique for hypnofertility in my first script book, and it's funny because there's a colleague of ours named Carol who runs a hypnosis training school and – uh, clinical center out east of here and um, I've walked in there to teach classes on speed inductions and things and she'll walk up to me and say there are five women pregnant around here because of you you know <laughs> and all of a sudden I become Bill Clinton the former president I did not know these women <laughs> I have not seen these women you know whatever it is but that's kind of our ongoing joke because the hypno fertility thing really does work yeah um, I also find that with the people I work with over the years, if you run into somebody who's resistant to being hypnotized, if you're doing some kind of a procedure or something like you were talking about earlier, the speed inductions I've created really do work very, very fast and very, very well they to do. reduce deep trance states because people don't have time to fight them. Yeah. If you're doing a 20 or 25 minute, 15 or even 10 minute verbal induction, you know, everybody can be a little James Bond when he's tried to a chair by a supervillain, you know, you're not yeah. getting me, you're not getting me, you know? And if you put them out in a split second or something, they have very little time to resist. Mm -hmm. So it works tremendously across the board. And to me, if you're going to call yourself a hypnotist, you should know how to hypnotize people very, very fast. For a lot of years, I spoke in front of Rotary Clubs and Kiwanis and other you know, service clubs, lions and tigers and bears, I guess, whatever else there is. <laughs> and, um, and they'd say, okay, you got seven minutes, give your talk. I don't care if you speak as quickly as I do, you still can't do a 20 minute induction in seven minutes. So you have to do something to wow them and put them out in a hurry. And maybe I can put out three or four volunteers really quick and then show hypnotic phenomena to show that this is real because some of us are still in a position in this world we're living in of having to prove that this is actually real to a lot of people. Like I wear these shirts when I live my life or I'm, I'm going to do a show somewhere perhaps if it's warm out and people will come up to me and say, hypnosis, is that real? No, no, we're all just liars and we're taking money from people. Of course it works. And it's one of the few things that actually works right across the board. One of the things I teach in the clinical work when I train people is the idea is we don't necessarily need to know where the issue is coming from to resolve it. And most people are kind of blown away because other standard models of therapy uh, push you back to where did it come from, who was there, and all these other you know questions. When in reality, if a person's in deep enough trance, just get them to forgive it, release it, and move on from it. Another point is that many self-identify as a trauma that's happened to them. You know, I was insulted, I was yelled at, I was abused, I was beat up, I was shot, I was robbed, I was raped, God knows the list of horrible things but what they fail to acknowledge is two and three seconds later 
they were getting back up on their feet and going forward with their life. The heroic aspect of them was kicked in. And that's something I teach all the time and actually put into my sessions. Activate that mighty inner hero part of you. And when that hero is up on the surface, no longer can you play that game of, you know, victim cringing in the corner. And all of a sudden, the empowerment's there. You can't say who you are by one moment of your life. That's not you. Like we talked on the emails back and forth before the interview about smokers. And they identify, I am a smoker. No, you're a person who has a bad habit that we can resolve. That's not who your core primary aspect of your being is. And yet so many people are stuck in that model. I find it mind-blowing to think about it a lot of times. But they'll say, I am person that XYZ happened to. Or I am person that XYZ trauma created. And when reality, um, you know, there's just so much more than that as to who these people are. They're mighty heroes that broke through that moment and went on with their lives. And yet it's mind-bending to me that they're stuck in that moment. You're not acknowledging who you've been since that happened. So part of what we do in the private session work and in the work I'm training people to do is the idea of acknowledging that hero and bringing that hero up to the surface. And when the hypnotist is working with that person, when they're in hypnosis, get agreement from the subconscious. Nod your head yes, you're willing to forgive what's, what happened in the past and move on from it. Nod your head yes, you now know a better chapter of your life just started. Be excited. Nod your head. Show me how excited you are. And when they're in hypnosis, you're plugged in directly to their subconscious mind, which is where all that stuff is sticking in the first place. Yeah, I think yeah. a lot of the work that you do, John, is on a core soul level where you're mm -hmm. saying all of us are superheroes and all you have to do is acknowledge it and touch into that and bring that superhero from the core that really is who you are out into the world so that you can function under that belief. It's true. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I, I very often hypnotize people they don't even know I've done it because I, I do it very conversationally. Right, it, I do that too. Great fun because they say you can't hypnotize me, and they, they don't even know they're already hypnotized. And I, I I was I was at a I was at a convention with the Speakers Academy that I was a member of, and my name was pulled out of the hat to give a, a five minute speech. You know, five mm -hmm. minutes not very long, and uh, on any topic you like. So I thought. I'll, I'll give them a speech on stage hypnosis. And although I'm a hypnotist, I've never done stage hypnosis before in my life. And I, I know the techniques, I've just never done it. And so I thought I'll give a, a, talk, I'll give a talk on stage hypnosis. And there, there was about 25 people in the audience. So I, 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 I hypnotized them all while I was standing at the front. And I, I asked for a volunteer to come to the front. I thought I'll, I've only got time for one person. So I asked for anybody in the audience who couldn't be hypnotized. I thought, if I'm going to do this, I might as well do it big. I'll find the one person in the audience who can't be hypnotized. And several of the people put their hands up. They couldn't be hypnotized. That told me they want to be hypnotized, mm -hmm. even though they felt they couldn't be hypnotized or they were going to prove to me that they couldn't be hypnotized. And I, I picked a lady and she came up to the front and I managed to, with a rapid induction, I, I hypnotized her in moments. And she was... And I told her that her legs would remain firm and she remained balanced. But she was so deeply hypnotized, I had to hold on to her because I could see that she was just going to keel over. And it was great fun. And I, I changed, and um, her name was Valerie, and, and I, it's on my YouTube channel if anyone wants to see it. And and I changed her name to George, and I got her to forget the numbers and counting her fingers. And, and I only had five minutes to do it, so I had to do it quick. And considering it's the first time I've ever done that, I think I did pretty well. Sounds and like it. it. Hilarious. But she was, she was freaked out because I changed her name to George and the, and the audience was telling her that name was Valerie and <laughs> she was confirming that it was George. But she was freaked out because I didn't know that her boyfriend's name was George and she thought oh. I was she thought I was pl plundering her mind and, and getting all kinds of other information out of her possibly. But it was great, great, mm. really good. And I, perhaps I should do more of that. Probably. I did a sketch with that at a major university here, not far from where Connie lives, down in the Washington, D.C. area. And I said, every time I touch your shoulder, your name will change. Mm. So first he was Phil, and then he was Bill, and then he was Tom, and he was all these different names. 
And finally, I'm thinking, how am I going to get out of this sketch? So I touched him on the shoulder. I said, and your name is again? And he said, my name is Mary, and I'm a very pretty girl. And the audience laughed, and I just said, sleep. And I thought that was really fantastic. Yeah. And it wasn't out of me. It was out of him, obviously. I didn't suggest that. But it's one of those things where you never know what's in somebody's subconscious mind mm -hmm. and what's going to come out of them. Um, there's some really – my favorite sketches in a show are the things that are spontaneous that I don't expect. I had a sketch that I came up with an idea for a bunch of years ago, and I was in Manhattan being interviewed by this lady celebrity who wanted to train with me. And I'm coming back home. I'm in a tunnel going through, about to go into New Jersey to come back to Staten Island where I live. And I get a phone call. What are you doing tomorrow morning at like 3 a.m.? I said, I don't know, developing sheet wrinkles on my face? I don't know. <laughs> and um, he said, no, no, you're doing a show from Massachusetts. That's like five hours north of here. So I had to come nice. 45 minutes south back to my home. I had literally 20 minutes to book a hotel room and then get up there. Wow. And I had this sketch. I said, I had the idea, you know, a sheepdog is licking your face just a little too much. Every human makes that face when you're being kissed by a dog who loves you. We kind of like it, but we kind of feel funny about it. We kind of make a strange face. And I tried that that night. And uh, three of the young ladies in the middle started French kissing the dog back. And I almost fell on the floor <laughs> laughing so hard I couldn't talk because I didn't expect that reaction. But the, and it was really strange. The three young ladies in the middle, it was a high school graduation, where with their tongues out kissing the dog back and i would never have imagined that but now that's back in the i put that in the show because it's funnier than anything i could possibly write as a sketch when you look at the reality around you so we, you pick up things where you can find them you know it's true when, when i did the um the stage show with all five minutes of it with barry before i got her to come up i had all the audience sit and face each other and I got them to look into each other's eyes and hypnotize each other. So I really used that five minutes. And I, I may have stretched it to seven minutes or something. And uh, but, it was, but everybody in the audience was hypnotized because I had them all facing each other, looking into each other's eyes and being the hypnotized. So I, I really made use of that five minutes. And I'd love to do it again. I, I think perhaps I am a, a natural stage hypnotist, perhaps. Could be. Could be, yeah. It, well, I've, at least I've, for demonstrations. You know, there are some stage hypnotists or calling themselves stage hypnotists that only are doing demonstrations instead of full bore shows. That's true. And as yeah. much as I prefer that if they're being hired to do a full bore show, that they honor their contract, you know, um, there are some people sliding by on I've hypnotized two or three people, hmm. but you seem natural at doing demonstrations. That would be great to get in front of groups, whether it's, you know, um, whatever fraternal organizations are in England. Um, I'm sure there's many of them you know, male and female. I did something for the Red Hat Society, which I think got started in England a bunch of years ago. It, it was something about a poem. A woman said when she got older and retired, she'd want to wear a red, a purple hat and a red dress or something, or a red hat. Other way around. Dress. Yeah, yeah, I had a bad, I know I really, but as soon as it came out of my mouth, I knew it was wrong. <laughs> but um, they were fun to work with. I went in the back of a bar and actually got paid for doing some demonstrations back there. And the, the ladies really loved it. But from what I understand, they're the fastest growing, um, like group women's women organization yeah women's organization in the world yeah. Yeah. so there's all kinds of places you can demonstrate that stuff and from that you wind up with clients or possible show leads or other things that come across birthdays yeah yeah, yeah. parties i'm wondering what, parties in england i'm wondering where our audience is i'm, I'm, I'm encouraging them with this ticker down the bottom to interact with some questions but um they're not doing it, which is which is a shame. But maybe maybe it's they'll okay. send, send some comments in the real replay, perhaps. Well, if they do hashtag replay, at least you'll know that's what it is, and they can ask mm -hmm. a question. And if you want to, you can pass them on to us. If there's something in the future that needs to be answered, we're both open to it. Mm -hmm. Right, John? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. How how long have you been a hypnotist, um, Connie? Octopony. Um, since 1995. 1995. That's um, 25 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem much until you do the math, and then all of a sudden it seems like, wow, 25 years. Yeah. You know, the time goes past. It really <laughs> it does. does. And John's been doing it since he was three years old. So, you know, do the math. Mm hmm. 
I've been playing my age, so good luck with the man. <laughs> no, don't, don't talk to John. He's just he's just a show off, isn't he? Three years old. Well, John always, I think, looks younger than what he actually is. So it's a fun guessing game sometimes. Yeah, he'll probably be, he'll probably be reaching retirement age soon. I should think. But what what is he? 15? Oh, I don't think so. Retirement age for hypnotists is like ninety years old, or maybe older if you go to the NGH. <laughs> Well, it's, it's frightening to think that I'm in my 66th year. And, and if you want to jot it down, 25th of August, I'll be 66. Any, anybody wants to send me any gifts? Particularly, <laughs> I'm particularly interested in money. Well, I'm, my birthday is August 22nd, so we're both, you know, on the cusp of, I'm on the cusp of Leo Virgo and you're a Virgo, but I'm not giving my age up so easily. So just enjoy that wild guessing game. I, I, well, I, mine I, is Halloween, so I, think, I could be any age. I think you. I think you told me your age once, once, um, John. But I was gentleman enough. I forgot it. Just as well. <laughs> Just as well. He's a nice droid you were looking for. Just That's as well. right. <laughs> uh, you, you were born in. Oh, you you became hypnotist in ninety five. In nineteen ninety four, I was delivering a baby in the street. Wow. With um, hypno birthing, she didn't feel a thing. I wow. didn't. Funny enough, I, it's strange that she because I didn't feel anything either. <laughs> <laughs> although, although I did manage, and I'm not a drinker, but I did manage after I left her to drink a pint of Guinness in about three seconds flat. Wow, and you must bar, have been thirsty. The barman, and the barman said, are you okay? I said, I just delivered a baby, but he didn't believe me. Oh, they are kind of slippery. I noticed that when I was when I was pulling the umbilical cord from around its neck, mm -hmm. which um, I hadn't anticipated because you know, I, had, I, hadn't, I hadn't delivered that many babies at the time. Yeah. I saw this umbilical cord around its neck. And I'm thinking that doesn't look right, and, <laughs> and I, I was expecting it to be like pulling a piece of of um, coat hanger from its neck, you know, which would be pretty tough. But yeah. when I pulled it, it was it was very elastic it's and very came, pliable. It was very slippery as well. Yep. And I managed to get it off very easily, but I was quite relieved at that because I'm thinking this is where I'm going to get the lawsuit for killing the baby or something. 85% of us are born with an umbilical cord at least around our neck once, and usually more like three times, depending yeah. on how long it is. Well, I've only been born once, so I don't know how you got these statistics. 85 born with an umbilical cord around our neck at least once, but I've only been born once, so um, I think I may mis be misunderstanding you, perhaps. I think so. <laughs> I would imagine it's fairly stretchy, right? It, yeah, is. it, was, it, was, it was. It was like... Like a rubber band, I, I think I could have stretched that like this, probably. Yeah, yep, you probably flexible. could. And um, it was really uh, school, shooting at somebody, you know. The baby was was so tiny. I'm thinking, where's the because because when you see babies on TV, they're this big, and I'm thinking, <laughs> no. where's the rest of it? No. I was thinking it was a setup. So, have you been involved in several births since then? No, I'm not a doctor at all. Right. I, I'm, I'm just a passerby who, who who doesn't mind his own business. Ah, okay. So I, I, saw this, I saw this lady. She was a, I think she was Jamaican. She mm. was leaning on a, leaning on a wall. It was it was a tire repair place, and she was a pool, pool of water underneath her. She was a black mm -hmm. lady. Uh -huh. So so I have to say, these these um, white people are all walking past her, ignoring her. Uh -huh. And but once I stopped to give her. Once I stopped to give her some help, they're all coming back wanting to be an audience. So I, I and I don't normally swear, but I, I did on that occasion. I told them where to go. Good. Not, this is not a football match kind of thing. <laughs> and I took her into a, a self-serve laundrette oh. called the, the Wash-In Laundrette. It's changed its name now. It's, it's called Laundrette now, I think. They, they changed the name from the Wash-In. No, no, it's called Laundry now, I think. I don't know why they changed the name, and the and the marketing, the telephone box that was outside has gone now. In fact, all the telephone boxes has gone now because all no. you people have got your mobile phones. I've I've never had a mobile phone, really. Don't, never had one. Don't want one because I, I used to work in um in microwave weapons when I was oh, in. Oh yeah. So that's why I don't want to carry one because I I know what they do to you. Uh, nobody will believe me, of course. No, I think a lot of people believe you. There are EMF um, little things that you can put on your phone to help mitigate some of that electromagnetic field. And, and you really believe they work, do you? Um, I believe it can collect on it. I don't 
usually yeah. use yeah. one. I have one near my bedside, though. Trust me, they don't work. Okay. They Trust me, they don't. Throw it away. <laughs> and, and throw your phone away as well. <laughs> and you sent me a few dollars, so that's good. Thank you. <laughs> yes. One of the key things, too, of being a hypnotist is that everybody already is in some form of hypnosis. Yes. So our lives are dramatically easier because all you're doing is deepening something they're already in most of the time. Mm -hmm. I've only had, I think, a handful of speed inductions that didn't work, and that was because the person in the chair I was working with was either too terrified or too resistant. Um, it was once at a wedding years ago where my ex-wife now, at the time I was still married to her, second cousin's girlfriend, try and follow that with a flow chart, um, was talked into being hypnotized by her boyfriend, her, my ex-wife's second cousin. And I dropped her out. I put him out first so she wouldn't be afraid. And then she dropped out really quick shoulders to knees and then yanked her head up screaming. And I said, what happened? And she said, everything went black. I said, what happens when you close your eyes normally? And she went, oh, yeah. And then I put her right out the second go, you know. But I tend to be relentless if we're going to put somebody out with hypnosis. I go right at them because there's too many people that will tell you they can't be hypnotized. I was telling Connie the other day, I was working at a health fair at a college in New Jersey. And I had worked there a couple of years. And every time I was there, the campus activities lady wasn't in her office that day or something. I find it really mind boggling that when I'm there, nobody's home, you know. So the last time I was there, I walked in and I said, hi, I'm a, my name is John Sabone. I'm a hypnotist. Here's my card, all this stuff. And um, she said to me, I can't be hypnotized. I'm one of those people can't be hypnotized. And I thought to myself, you haven't met me before, you know, so just sit in that chair and follow my fingers. And I put her right out. She dropped like a sack of potatoes. Her shoulders and knees were together. She went right out, dropped right out. And then when I brought her up, uh, she was kind of blown away. And then a few minutes later, she got mad at me because I shot down her story. But she couldn't be hypnotized. She told me something about volunteering on a cruise ship and um, some nonsense about how um, the hypnotist couldn't do it. Should I go back to the audience? And I said, you're just not good in front of a crowd. Mm -hmm. That's really what that was, pretty much. But then she got mad because I shot down her story, like, because how dare you prove me wrong, you know? But other than people like her, the average person is very glad to be hypnotized. I do a lot of demonstrations in, if I'm wearing a shirt like this and people know who I am, across mm -hmm. the back, it's worldfamoushypnotist.com. Um, people are actually climbing all over each other. Could you do something for me? Put me out, put me out. I've then, seen it happen. I've gone to restaurants with him where that happens. Mm -hmm. And I'm pulling people to chairs and that kind of thing. And sometimes it's the wait staff. And you got to be cool with the managers in those places because I had a manager way upstate in New York over here come over me. She was fine. She was perfectly good, the manager. It was uh -huh. the district manager that walked in and said, don't hypnotize people in the dining room. I said, would the bathroom be better or maybe your office? <laughs> you know, I mean, what would you like me to do this? And then, you know, being in New York, the first thing that came out of my mouth after that was, what's your name and how do I get a hold of your boss, you know? I said, I'm one of the customers here. Don't yell at me, you know? <laughs> and that whole thing kind of changed the entire vibe of the uh, moment. And the whole place was laughing, you know, afterwards. Mm -hmm. But um, I've done this in a lot of places in public. I've hypnotized people in Times Square and Washington Square Park in Manhattan and on the Las Vegas um, Fremont Street area, old Las Vegas, and on the Las Vegas Strip with people walking by. I just put them right out. Mm -hmm. And um, it's amazing how these people are kind of astounded all of a sudden you're a street performer and you've got a crowd forming around you of potentially a hundred or more people. Um, I remember walking up this famous, they put these red steps on like 47th or 48th street in Manhattan in times square where people go there and sit there and watch life go by. And I had a sign over my head, ask me to hypnotize you, the trance master, my stage name. And, you know, being New Yorkers, it's pretty funny. They avert their eyes, look at their shoes. They're, checking their fingernails, their wristwatch, whatever it is. And one lady said to me, I'll do it. And I put it right out. Then all of a sudden, I was the sole focus of all the attention of these people. <laughs> so if you're a hypnotist and you want to get known for being a hypnotist, as long as you're working safely and sanely, um, there was even a guy there shooting a YouTube channel show, and he has to sit down and let me hypnotize him. And I never saw the video, but I know he shot video of me hypnotizing him. His thing is pranking other people. He said, well, now it's not my time to get pranked. So I put him right out. But I just love doing this. And so does Connie and mm -hmm. so do you. It's a matter of breathing and eating and sleeping this stuff. Yeah. If you mm -hmm. want to be terrific at this, you have to be there. Dedicated. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, 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 when I'm with people, it's whenever I'm with people, it's my mission to change their state and make them feel good. Yes. Because so many, it, particularly where I live, so many of people are, are walking around with long faces. Yeah. And, and it's so easy to, to make them smile and make them feel better. Every time I walk into a supermarket and, and there's the checkout girl there, nobody, they're wearing a name badge. Nobody ever reads the name. And I, I do. I say, hello, Sophie, or whatever the name is. How are you? It takes no effort. And immediately you've, you've changed their, their, their whole demeanor because I, I treat people with respect. Every time I go to the takeaway store, if, if I order th three pieces of chicken and chips, when I get home, I, I very often find I've got five pieces of chicken. Uh -huh. I, I treat them with respect. There you go. And, and this is, I'm doing hypnosis on them. I'm not asking for five pieces. Right. Very often I can't even eat five pieces. Right. But I always get five pieces because I'm, I'm using hypnotic techniques. It's, it's just a smile, a, you know, a, 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 some um, a, a hello, a goodbye. And these are hypnotic techniques, and I change their demeanor. And it's it's what's in my mind. It's my intention. Intention is everything as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And that's why back in the day, years ago, people started saying to me, you must be a hypnotist because I changed the way they felt and because I looked right. into their problems. And it, it's, yeah. it's an amazing skill, and nobody taught it to me. It, it just sort of happened, and which, which is a shame because – when I was a kid, I, 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 without without bringing you to a pity party, my, my upbringing, my background was appalling. I had, I had nothing to be happy about. So I, I got when I when I got away from that environment, I just decided I was going to be happy, and I was going to smile, and I was going to change people and not let not let them have the background I had. And so um, that's why I guess people said I was a hypnotist. Hmm. Um, I, I was in a bar a couple of years back at Christmas, and there was a woman there who, who said that that she couldn't be hypnotized, and, and and Paul McKenna had told her that she couldn't be hypnotized. I said, "Oh, really?" And and I, I listened to her, and she, she she felt that she was overweight, and and I looked at her, and I thought, "What's she talking about? She was stunning," and she was there with her husband, and and I listened to her, and and everything that that I could see told me that she would be an excellent subject for hypnosis, and. And I, I told her everything you've that I see from you, everything you've told me shows me that you would be very good at hypnosis. And I said, "Would would you like me to hypnotize you now? Would you like me to show you?" And and she said, "Yes." So I, I said, "Just put your hand out like that, hold it up like that, and look into my eyes." And I just pushed her hand down. And I said, "Asleep," and she was gone, just like that. She was in a deep hypnosis, and it took moments. It was so easy, mm -hmm. and. And then I, I I gave her some commands for for well being, and and all that kind of stuff, and she 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 told me some things about herself which I won't share with you because they were confidential, and I, I gave her some suggestions to remove all of that kind of stuff, and when I brought her around, she said, "That's incredible, that's amazing. I, I feel so different and changed and really amazing." And and she said that she would contact me, but she never did because the no. He's they don't. Yeah. And her husband was amazed, and he was pleased, and he said that she would def he would definitely make sure she contacted me, but, but she didn't. No. And uh, I, I, she viewed it as a freebie, I guess. It's amazing, <laughs> Either that or sometimes they feel embarrassed, yeah. you know, because they were vulnerable to a stranger. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think people are more vulnerable to a stranger that they feel safe with than someone that they know. You know, like a neighbor or something like that. Well, she wasn't a complete stranger because although I met her the first time, she was a good friend of a good friend of mine. And these oh. were all people from this was a, a magic circle. You've heard of the magic circle? It's like the the, the American Magic Association, but uh, British. Okay. Um, and um, this was the magic circle, which is mm -hmm. a big organization over here. And um, they, they're all members of the Magic Circle that had been invited to to an event in, in, in a pub in London. And um, so it wasn't as if I was completely a stranger. Ah. Because I, I came from good stock. <laughs> magicians <laughs> love hypnosis. Sorry? Magicians love hypnosis. I've trained yeah. a lot of magicians. Yeah. And yeah. it's funny, I went to an event out in Las Vegas 
a couple of years ago called um, Wonderground. My friend Jeff McBride, who's a famous magician, runs that event. And what they do is they have the first third of it is a lot of stage magic. And then in the middle, they do a close-up demonstration series with mm -hmm. magicians all over the room. And you can go from here to there to here to there. And then they do another thing at the end, which is more on stage. And he said to him, I was walking past me because we're friends. He said, watch out for this guy. He'll hypnotize you. And I said, you want me to work a little bit? He said, go crazy. So mm -hmm. I was jumping around, just putting people out one after another. I had a big crowd That's around me. So yeah. all of a sudden, it was magician, 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 and then me. <laughs> and that was fun. Yeah. And I'm amazed at how the magicians love hypnosis. The first time I went to that, I've only been there twice because it's like on a Thursday night once a month in a hookah bar. And um, I walked in there the first time, and it was all these magicians that were in from China. They had the mm -hmm. top female magician and a top teenage magician from China there. And um, they both won major like contests in China. And both of them ran over and grabbed me and were taking pictures. I can't believe you're here. I'm like, who? You know, I'm just me. Celebrity. You know? Yeah, but <laughs> it's weird when you get picked out as a celebrity. There were some hypnosis yeah. shows in Las Vegas where they stopped the show in the middle. And it's like, we've got a famous celebrity in the audience. So I'm looking around like, who? You know, yeah. Sinatra back to life or who's here, you know? <laughs> and they put the spotlight on me. And then nobody tells you what to do. I'm doing the royal wave. I'm doing one of these. You know, I'm going <laughs> pointing fingers. I've seen that on TV shows. Nobody, it, the light must be on you for like 20, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, but it feels like you're there for a month. Yeah. Because you don't know what's going on and what to do about mm -hmm. it. So you just, you know, double finger guns or, you know, whatever you have to do. <laughs> but um, it's, it's quite an honor in my view to be treated that way, actually. You know, and I, it I, is. I, yes. I find it to be really, really nice. And I'm very respectful of the people who've done it. And let me just say it publicly, I thank them. I think that's really a nice place to be. Yeah. Um, I, I, right, I'm sorry. I, I, I had that. I'll get some comments. I, I do apologize. I missed that. Let's see who this. Beryl, goodness me, Beryl. Let's let's put that comment up. Beryl, I'm sorry I didn't see that oh, before. Oh, hey, I've been, Beryl. I've been waiting too long. And um, comment from Beryl. Lovely to see you, Beryl. And um, I, I wonder. Could, could I wonder if Beryl might like to join us? I could find the link and. Cool. How can I get one of you would like to join us? We'd have a chat with Beryl. Would that be nice? Yeah, that'd be great. That's fine. Let me see if I can, um, how can I get the link to Beryl? And that way we can find out if Beryl is going to be at HT Live. Yes. HT Live is currently the biggest hypnosis conference, to my knowledge, in the world. Go and to it's out in Las Vegas coming up the end of this month into the beginning of next month. The 28th, 29th, yeah. no, 30th, 30th yeah. through, the, through the 3rd of yeah. August. Yeah. Yeah. 30th of July. That's and um, yeah, um, she's, she's trying I'm, to hang out with Beryl. I don't know if you want to join us, Beryl, but I'm sending the link to you in your Facebook message. That's great. Beryl is another wonderful hypnotist. Yeah. And she travels all over the world doing hypnosis, usually personally for people. But she's oh. a great teacher, too. Beryl's multitasking cooking dinner. That's a shame, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> it's lovely to see you, Beryl. Well, we're glad to see you and hear from you. And the U.S. is closed to non-U.S. So she won't be coming over. Oh, we'll miss you. Yeah. The U.S. is closed to non-U.S. citizens. I didn't know. I didn't like, know either. That's... You'll like this new next message from Beryl. <laughs> you approve of that one, John? Please, I'm embarrassed. Please, I'm so shocked. Yeah, Thank just you. keep coming. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Beryl. Very <laughs> much an honor. Thank you. That message down then, John. For you, kid. Thank you. I, I better take it down. I, I can see that you're you're embarrassed by that one. Yes, I'm turning purple. With <laughs> yeah, just just keep it coming. <laughs> You want me to put it back up? Years ago oh, on the Tonight Show, uh, Johnny Carson used to say, please, and he would go like this under the, where he thought the camera was. Yeah. He would like, give me more applause type of thing like this. But uh, he thought the camera was a little above that, but he, you know, it wasn't. So you'd see him doing that. <laughs> you, you're talking about embarrassment, John. Years ago, I was, I was in London with, with a friend of mine who, who's called Danny Shine, and he goes around uh, London harassing the police with a megaphone. Oh. He's, he's, he's 
what he calls a subversive comedian, as he goes around London championing our rights to free speech by using a megaphone. And he, he's a tremendous gap. And you can find him, if you look up YouTube, look up Danny Shine, you'll see him going around London with his megaphone and and teasing the police because he, he goes around talking on his megaphone uh, 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 about um, freedom of speech and challenging people with the megaphone. And he, he's a lovely man. He does it in a very uh, good way. And, and sound very people, smart. And people people call the police to, to stop him. And he's, he's only doing things within his rights. And he, he's very funny. And you'll, you'll laugh if you watch him. Hmm. But I was with him one day, and he was on the megaphone, and he started saying, caution, there's a hypnotist working the area. And... And then he threw, and then he put the the megaphone into my hands, oh. and, and it was encouraging me to hypnotise people over the megaphone. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and so there I was, not expecting to have the megaphone in my hands, and um, so I'm I'm having, so I'm calling people over to me using the megaphone. So I had this big crowd of people around me, hypnotising them in Oxford Street, and it was and it was so unexpected. But I had this big crowd. And hypnotizing everybody. And there's one chap who, who wanted to be hypnotized, and I said to him, "What, it, what could I do for you?" And he 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 was nail biting, and he wanted me to stop stop him biting his nails. And I thought, "What? Well, well, I can do that, but I'd have no way of knowing if I'd cured him." But I did it anyway. So I, I did an instant induction on him, and gave him some 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 help with the nail biting. And when I brought him out. He said, and he was he was exuberant. He, he was he was convinced that I cured him, and he and he showed me his nails. He, they were bleeding. He'd been biting them so much, and so, so I did an emotional detox and stuff to, to help him. And he was convinced that I cured him of his nail biting. So convinced that he took me and Danny and, and another friend who was with us into in, into Soho Square, where there was a vegetarian restaurant, and bought us all lunch. And he was absolutely convinced that we that I'd cured him, and he'd been biting his nails all the time that I was there before I hypnotized. Thank you, and I I wrote up something in the chat for Beryl. Did, so. did you, where where was where where where? What? Oh oh, you've you've written it in the private chats. Oh, was that private? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you, you have to you have to um put it in the public chat. I didn't know there was a difference. Oh, there you go. One of the things I like about street stuff, I've watched a lot of YouTube video. They have pianos in some of your train stations in England. Really? And oh. there's some of these people sit down, they're plunking along, and then some strange guy or kind of looks like a hobo or something sits down, and they're playing the most beautiful concert stuff. And sometimes like three people jump on the bench, and they're all playing the piano at the same time. That's a lot of fun in your, you know, your train stations. I've seen yeah. that numerous times that bull that megaphone thing reminded me of that yes. um i've done hypnosis and speed inductions in all kinds of places as a matter of fact in the county where i live here in new york city any major street i can go down as soon as the civilization besides just houses you know if it's a strip mall or a hotel or i'm like i've worked in that block i've worked on that block i've worked on that block that block over here i've got a demonstration over here hypnotize somebody in this store that store the mall whatever it was I shot TV in the mall over here with a show that was on Time Warner Cable called On the Beat or Off the Beat. And I had um, to hypnotize the woman who was the host of the show. Her husband was the show producer. And all of a sudden, we had 300 people surround us. And because it was a mall, on the second floor, there was another 300 people. So I had her milking cows. I told her her bottom had gotten 10 times bigger. Why? She told me she was eating candy and cookies and all these crazy things that we did. And the producer comes over when we finished doing the shot, and he said to me, um, that was great. How are we going to clear these crowds? I said, do you trust me? He said, yes. And I said, can I do what I want to do? He said, what are you going to do? I said, just watch. I said, next. And everybody was gone. <laughs> Instantly removed 600 people by saying one word, yeah. which I think is quite a hypnotic feat when you think about it, actually. It is. It so, reminds me of when I was doing a health fair, and it was at the um, – WPF, you know, or W, whatever. It was the Veterans of Foreign Wars place. And I had a, 
a video set up of women giving birth. And um, first of all, they told me to take it down because it was X rated. Now, I don't know how it can be X rated if someone's giving birth, but whatever, because it's kind of different. Um, but I also had people walking on the other side of the auditorium with their fingers like this saying, stay back. I don't want to get pregnant. Now, honestly, if I could get pregnant, get someone pregnant by looking at them or doing hypnosis on them, then I would be making millions of dollars and I wouldn't have to be at a health fair at a VFW. So, I so have, I have understand. You, I'd have to keep you blindfolded if that was the case. So you wouldn't look at them. You know, you'd have to wear like dark sunglasses or something like, don't make me take these off. You know, that's right. <laughs> that's a great sketch for a, uh, Comedy hypnosis shows. I'm thinking. Oh, there you go. You can, I can have build it. something like that for you. <laughs> Next time I put you in a show or something, you know, like that we I had a, I had Connie in a hypnosis show a couple of years ago <laughs> at the National Guild of Hypnotist Convention, and um, amongst a lot of other people, you know. But if I ever get you in a show again, that's coming up. We're gonna make that happen. <laughs> You're staring at all the hypnotized people, and all of a sudden they're pregnant. I think that'd be very funny. Yeah, it would be, especially since I've been in shows where they're. They're saying, oh, this this guy is pregnant. Help him deliver the baby. And being a, a hypnobirther, you know, they're going, push, push. I'm like, no, no, don't push. In hypnobirthing, you breathe the baby down. You just breathe, you know. But as far as the act goes, they want somebody up there saying, push, push, push. And I'm like, that's not the way you do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I saw you do that show with somebody else. I don't know who the hypnotist was, but I saw that show. It was show a woman. Again. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that show. And you were, you were pretty vehement about it. Like, that's not the way you do that. Stop, stop. I know what I'm doing. So that's pretty funny. I remember that. Yeah. I, 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 I've not, I was not trained in hypnobirthing when I came across the, the, the lady who was having the baby. Yeah. So I very much um, did it by the seat of the pants. And I, I did a negotiation. Hers with her. are yours. I, sorry? I so, said, hers are yours, the seat of your pants or the seat of her pants? See to my pants. I, I did a no negotiation with her. I, I said to her, look, you're going to be okay because we've got three experts here. I said, you're an expert because you've had three babies before, so you know what you're doing, don't you? I said, the baby is an expert because they've been doing this for millions of years. They know what they're doing. I said, I'm an expert because I've done this before. That was a total lie. <laughs> yeah. I, I said, I'm also a hypnotherapist, so we're going to do this painlessly because you don't want – that baby's first experience to be all of all of your pain and stress and suffering going down the umbilical tube to that baby, do you? Because you love that baby, don't you? And you don't want that baby's first experience to be all of that stress, do you? And and, and she agreed with me. So by, by agreeing with me, she agreed to having no pain. And that's exactly what she had, no pain. That's great. So it was a it was a it was a um a negotiated painless birth, as far as I'm aware. That's and great. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well, I'm sure you did a wonderful job. It sounds like you did a lot of mm. a lot of good for a lot of people. I well, well, that one. I didn't know whether she was supposed to push or what, but I, I just told her just relax into it, and everything yep. would be fine. Yep, and that's pretty much hypnobirthing is that you relax into it. You take a lot of deep breaths, and one of the mm -hmm. reasons why you're supposed to get started fairly early in the pregnancy is so that you learn how to breathe, you learn how to relax, you learn yeah. how to be in your body and be in tune with the baby while it's being birthed. I've yeah. actually had women who went to, well, appeared to go to sleep Mm -hmm. while they were in the largest part of the labor because they're mm -hmm. completely inside their body talking with the baby, you know, and so they're in what's called the birthing body. And I've had doctors actually be concerned and say, she, she can't be having the contractions and everything that it says on the monitor because she's asleep. And I'm like, she's not asleep. She's in conversation with the baby, making sure that everything's working out. And I actually had one doctor who said, you've got to wake her up. And so I tapped her on the shoulder and I said, open your eyes, look at the doctor, tell him everything's okay. And then you can go back in. And that's what she did. And he's like, that's amazing. I've never heard of something like that. I was yeah. like, well, you've never been at a hypnobirth. You know? Yeah. 
But what, what, my, my lady was in conversation with the baby, I think, because I was I was telling, getting her in sync with everything and getting her into a state of flow, and um, and I was very much taking. Um, I, I was I was inspired, I would say, because when when I'm working with hypnosis with people, and I think I've had this discussion with John before. When I'm working in hypnosis with people. I, I tap into the collective consciousness and I get myself into yeah. a state of flow and that's what I do. And I, I get into uh, a state of flow with the client and I connect my spirit with the client. Mm -hmm. and, and my clients very often tell me that they feel it. And I've, I've had people that I'm with who don't believe in spirit, they don't believe in God, they don't believe in any of that stuff but they've told me they felt some kind of a flow between us. Well, and that's very true with John too. And with myself as well, there's a certain magic about being with a client either, yeah. you know, during a birth or doing anything else, you know, smoking or whatever. Um, we, we get into that, that energy flow that goes between the client and yourself. And yeah. John and I have talked about it often about how, you know, we sort of jump into this pool with them and we're swimming and yeah. and getting them in the same places that they want to be by being in those places ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right, John? Right. And there's actually a connection to most of the clients I work with. I can feel what level of hypnosis they're in because in my mind, there's no longer a them and a me. There's an us. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's the us that's in the chair and there's the us that's leading the session. Mm -hmm. And it's like a single organism at that point, you're kind of blended with them intuitively, psychically, uh, mentally, emotionally, what they feel you feel. And That's I always know when to look over and I'll start seeing uh, things I gauge through hypnotic depth, depth yep. by. I start seeing fluttering eyelids yes. and I, I smile to myself, okay, they're halfway, you know, they're halfway mm -hmm. through the Aaron scale of hypnotic depth. Yes. And then I'll feel another level of depth drop in. I'll look over and their eyeballs are going back and forth behind their eyelids. And they're in stages four through six at that point in the Aaron scale of hypnotic depth testing. And um, what happens then is that uh, that's like plugging a USB jack directly into their mind. It's like taking one of these and just right into the side of their head. And everything you're saying is being taken literally. And you can correct all kinds of things that's in, that are in balance that way in a person's subconscious because um, it needs to be straightened out. You know, you, you have, as I said earlier in the beginning of our call, you have people identifying themselves as the traumas that happened to them. And that's not who they are. That's just something that you can use as an empowerment tool to show them how mighty they are and how different things can be. You know, the only two inherent fears we're born with is a fear of loud noises and a fear of falling. All the other fears people develop is something that they decided is important to be afraid of. It's yeah. a story they create around yeah. whatever trauma. So the idea yeah. is you can pass the trauma, realize how mighty you are, than you are than any trauma that can happen to you. After all, they're sitting with you in a session. They're living their life out in the world. That being the case, you know, what could, what story are you telling yourself versus what's real? What's reality? Reality is you not only did you survive that, but potentially you got stronger and learned something from it. So I get people, I was talking to a doctor the other day on the phone, he's a friend of mine, and he said to me, um, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying, like, no, you're not trying. Either you're doing it or you're not doing it. You know, get on the game, get in there and do it. Life is going past. Make your life the masterpiece it deserves to be. You know, if you love anything about your life, get so into it that everything else less than that is superfluous. Yes. I read you speechless, Keith Anthony. <laughs> I, I, no, I was checking the banners to see see if I could put any anything new up, and um, I was distracted. Oh. Um, <laughs> this, is what, this is what we call dead air, and probably I'm deader than most. <laughs> no, we we'll definitely plug in between, and you won't have any dead air. <laughs> and I and I've I've got an example of a, a banner up. Which, which take that down. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have, I'll have all my colleagues ribbing me about that later, if I'm they say. Sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we've, um, 
we 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 were talking we were talking about um what were we talking we we're talking about um hypnobirthing weren't we yes and oh no we're talking about energy going between us weren't we right yes. i've had people say to me when i've hypnotized them and, and made substantial change I've, I've, i particularly with the ladies they 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 look at me with a big smile on on their face and I, i'm wondering what's going through their mind they say what have you done to me who yes <laughs> And I, I wonder what they're feeling when they say that. Because I've, I've not, I've not done anything to them at all, yeah. except talk. And it's more likely uh, what you did with them that they enjoyed. Yes, but uh, you, you have to be careful when. when uh, that, that's why uh, very often when when it's a lady, I, I like to bring a friend with them just in case. Yeah. Because you, you, there is there is um, there is a risk of, um, or, or, or I like to video it as well. Right, with transference and that sort of thing. That's yeah. why when I work with children, I always have a parent there. Yes, very, very sensible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the uh, there is a transference of, of energy, and but that that energy is 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 amazing stuff, and it and you and you wonder what the energy is making them feel. But it can True. make them feel, it can make them feel very good, and um, how good is 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 is. Um, is is we <laughs> wonder what it's making them feel yeah and most of it or all of it is in their mind and since we don't know exactly what's going on in their mind yeah you know we have to be careful because people can misinterpret things yes they can indeed it's interesting mm, but, but but the thing that worries me is when i hypnotize them that the i have i have to make sure i keep the windows Closed because I don't want to lose them. Then they float, they float out there. <laughs> but I, I don't tell them that because I want to frighten them. Tie a string around their finger, and that way, if they're a balloon, they can float, and you still have some possession. Yeah. They put a little ID tag to them so in case somebody finds them, they send them back to you. <laughs> With the loss, call this number, you know? Put, uh, put, like put an RFID chip in, in their pocket so, that, so they, they can be returned. Kind of like a dog with a chip in its ear. Hmm. We turn to sender. Yes, I suppose we could we could get one that we could clip on their ear in case they do get lost. Oh, there yeah. you go, like an earring sort of thing. Yes, yes, <laughs> we could do that. Yes. No, also, too, you know, when you're working with energies in a private <laughs> session, I've had people tell me with their eyes closed, "What was that light show I saw?" Oh and yeah. What what light show were you talking about? I saw all these lights going around. And that's some kind of energy healing that takes place while you're working with them. It is. Yeah. Yeah. But it's hard to describe that to somebody who's a little nervous about coming in in the first place. <laughs> sometimes I'll just say, oh, that's part of the post-hypnotic effect. Man, you just succeeded like you don't even know yet. <laughs> yeah. like well, they're still open to suggestion. Why not give them that? But, True. you know, they, I, I really think sometimes they should have a little button under the table or something, you know, and set up a light effect. or Strobe. Um, I, had, I had a session one time in my home. And the tenant that had in the basement had a piano down there, an upright piano. So I was doing uh, an induction verbally. And um, about three paragraphs in, the lady downstairs starts playing this music, the same song, like Flora Lisa something, over and over and over again. So as I'm about to do the countdown, I'm going to count to 10. I get to two, she stops playing the piano. I get to four uh, on the countdown of 10. And I hear the door close downstairs. And by the count of six or seven, she had a BMW diesel which made a lot of noise. The car starts and she drives off. So by the kind of tenant, I bring this lady back and she says to me, wow, you can't believe what happened. I said, what? I heard the most beautiful music ever. I said, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. And you know what happened when you brought me out? I said, no, it stopped. I know I'll never smoke again. I said, good for you. <laughs> I like it. What am I going to do about that? I have, I, I'm not going to deny the story. Sure. I'm not going to stop her enthusiasm and stop the progress. So you have to kind of roll with it sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, it was really, it was really the strangest thing. And I do what all other hypnotists do when it gets noisy. I get louder. And now take another deep breath and relax, you know, because you're trying to drown out the background noise. But yeah. since then, I've invented a suggestion that all noises in the background you might hear deepen your hypnosis and grant you greater results. Yeah. So all things work. Mm -hmm. They do. And timing is often excellent. But also, if you notice something is going to happen, you can work that in ahead of time. Like I work 
where I'm near a hospital. So there are ambulances that go by periodically. And so I always say, you may hear an ambulance going by and you know that people are being helped in a way that they couldn't be if you wouldn't hear this ambulance. So you may hear an ambulance, you may hear a door close, you may hear a clock ticking. All of these things just take you deeper and deeper into trance. Mm. Yeah, it's it's great having that much power, isn't it? It is. Although we don't do it for the power. Well, it's, you know, it's when you talk about power, it's more working with the person instead of working on the person. Mm -hmm. And so it really isn't about power. It's more about being able to utilize your surroundings to help them do whatever it is that they want to do. Mm -hmm. It's about empowering the client. It's, yes, it's, you're empowering it's the client. Absolutely. It's great. The client is empowered. They can do anything. It's, it's great doing. being able to use everything in the in the environment to empower the client. Exactly. Yeah, like like when I when I when I did the, the the woman in the in the bar that I was talking about in the magic circle, it was so noisy in there. Oh yeah. But it it didn't didn't matter because it it all helped because I told her to listen to the noise. Because uh, I couldn't, because I couldn't hide it. I couldn't put it away anyway. I told right. them, to it. and it all helps. I've when worked on people in airports, very mm -hmm. much the same way. Very, very noisy area, but you just work with the arena that you're in. And that's that's when instant inductions are really useful because very the, helpful. The noise doesn't factor then. Mm -hmm. When Richard Nongod and I shot the speed trance videos, version one and later version two point zero. Um, the first bars we worked in were in Kansas. They were extremely noisy. As a matter of fact, I shot footage of me hypnotizing people in an arcade part of the bar. Wow. Or the pub, as you call it in England, with pinball machines and video noises and all kinds of stuff. And they went right out. Wow. It was so loud, I had to scream at them to get them into I'm screaming, Sh sleep at the top of my lungs. David Busters, huh? Yeah, but <laughs> it, was, it was not quite that, but it was very, there were two bars we went to in Kansas. And you want to talk about lack of rapport. I mean, I'm going into a cowboy area, Ooh. a cowgirl area, and I'm from New York. So to them, I'm the city slicker guy, you know? You and are. And I just went into the, the first bar. It was like the whole town was pretty much dying. It was a post office, uh, city hall, police fire, ambulance, and a, a pizza place, and this bar. Wow. And they had a little uh, trailer with chaser lights going around a sign saying, famous New York City hypnotist, one night only. And the entire town was there, men, women, and kids. And we had to shoot video in this really noisy environment. And the second place was another bar in the same town, a little further away, in a strip mall. And equally noisy, or if not noisier, and just making it work. Because um, some people have described me as like somebody who learned how to hypnotize out of the back of a comic book when you're a child. It never occurs to me somebody can't be hypnotized, so therefore everybody's hypnotizable. Well, it's a matter of making this stuff work no matter what. Get in there and bang it out, make it happen, because that's the time you have to work. So if somebody's available, get in there and do it. But Most people in your way. are under hypnosis at least 50 to 75% of the time anyway. Right. So if you can just tap into that, you can use it anytime. And another theory is we're pulling them out of their own hypnosis. Right. All the lies they're telling themselves, they've hypnotized themselves into believing. Mm -hmm. So pull them out of their own hypnosis and put them in your hypnosis. I did a show one time up at a prep school in New England, and um, the hypnotist they had there the year before did some really wacky stuff mm. that he probably shouldn't have done. He asked a young man and a young lady to go into a room and change pants with each other, which I think I would not even do that with a married couple, you know? Yeah, no. And um, one of the girls was a little traumatized from the previous year's show, mm. and another one was from Asia and had seen when she was a little girl some people walk into a cafe and a bomb went off. Oh, and both of them, I had to repair that because they, were, they weren't they were in the show. They were just in the audience. And I had to bring them into a separate room and get them out of their own hypnosis and get them into what I wanted. Mm. And um, the suggestions I gave both of them is you're feeling better than you have your entire life. And the following morning, I was dropping off the keys to the campus apartment. And this one young lady is running down the hall with her arms out the way a child would run towards an adult, you know, for a hug. Mm. And I didn't know what to do. I kind of just stood there. And she jumped up in the air and wrapped her ankles around mine and was kissing the side of my face. I feel better than I have my entire life. <laughs> and I said, where did I hear that before? Last night's show, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So um, 
Wow. It's amazing what we can just instantly remove. It's this quick when you decide that's the speed you want to work at. And if the person's amenable to releasing it that way, it all changes. I just find some of the clients who have a difficult time releasing something is that um, they're finding some kind of secondary gain or benefit right. to staying stuck. And yeah. I always tell them when they're in trance, you know, whatever secondary gain you're getting out of this, whatever the benefits you might be getting, whether it's emotional or mental or sympathy or whatever it might be, um, you never release that because you're bigger and better than that. And now it's time to improve. Mm -hmm. So the whole That's thing instantly right. changes. It's amazing how fast you can get instant change. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how many people stay stuck in the past and it ruins their relationships because they've they've taken something trivial and they dwell on it day after day after day and they build it up into some big monster that keeps them at each other's throats. My, my parents were like that. Mm. And it was a shame because I, I grew up with my mother being at my father's throat throughout my childhood wow. because, because of something trivial. Mm. And... And it was a shame that it wasn't until my mother was dying that they made it up and started loving each other again. That's too bad. It was, it was terrible because I, I always always wanted them to, to be loving when I was a child. And, and the, the whole household was, was filled with hatred when I was a child mm. because of something trivial that my mother couldn't let go of. Wow. Until but on the other hand, at least there was some reprieve near the end, what you said. Yeah. So at least it was some kind of a somebody tying the package into a no. bow at the end. At and, least it was something. And I, I didn't, I didn't get to hold my mother's, my own mother, my mother. I didn't hold her hand until in the nursing home when I took her pulse when she was dead. Oh dear. And but but I'm not. I don't not not bring it to a pity party because it was wonderful that I could do it in the end because I I prayed that that I would be there when she went and I was in the end and so and my father was alongside me and, and that was great because I'd, I'd never been close to either one of them until yeah. until the end so I got my wish in the end and you can't wish for more than that so it was okay in the end yeah. but it shouldn't and, and I and I'm and I'm saying this on camera because if anybody's listening and you're in a family don't let these things do that to you because yeah. these things are trivial don't hold on to them. You can just choose to let it stay in yesterday and live for today. And because you choose to hold on to these things and they're trivial, just let them go. Even if they're major, let them stay in yesterday and live for today and love each other. Love your children, love your husbands, love your wives, love your colleagues and your friends. And don't live in the past because you don't want the future to be a casualty of the past, do you? Mm -hmm. No, not at all. And so learn from my experience. I have found that many traumas over time become larger and larger as people make stories around them. And yeah. if you can get to the original whatever happened, mm -hmm. you can find that it may not have been much of anything. It may have just been a misunderstanding. And yeah. especially if it's something that happened to a child, they may have totally misunderstood what was going on, some miscommunication. And from that, they've made a trauma. And once you can take it like a ball of string and unwind it, many times there's not much at the core of it. And you can have them just let it go. Yes. It, all of our behavior is 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 like a ball of string or, or like an onion you can peel off the layers and yeah. it is the same if if you're a smoker I, I had a I had a guy recently who who phoned me up he, he wanted to quit smoking and and I didn't book him because I knew he wasn't committed yeah. although he, although he he has booked me for sports um I, th I think I put this in an email to you didn't right I? yeah yeah but he has quit smoking now because I, I said to him that You've always been a non-smoker because you bought the lie of big tobacco and big glamour and all that stuff. And I said, you've always been a non-smoker. Mm -hmm. And I said, you just have to pull that record out that you were sold all those years ago and put the original record back in that you're a non-smoker. And on the basis yeah. of that, he quit smoking. Wow. And, and, he, and, um, and now he's he's booked me for sports um, hypnosis. Right. And so it, when you... I've, I've 
I've had very few quit smoking clients because I, I usually lose them on the phone when, when I give them that reasoning and they <laughs> realize they don't need me. Yeah. But they, they realize how stupid it is and they realize they're not, they're not smokers. They realize they're not addicted. They realize they, they bought a lie all these years mm -hmm. and they just take that record out and put the old, the original record back in that they were a non-smoker. Mm. And it doesn't matter whether it's because you've, you've had that, that, that that um what what was the word you used that that misunderstanding mm. people who start smoking it's just a misunderstanding you didn't really want to do it i mean if you if you smoke one cigarette your lungs and your your mind tell you no it's horrible <laughs> don't yeah. do it again so if you have the second cigarette it's a misunderstanding isn't it yeah you've been Truly. you've just been having a misunderstanding every time you smoke that cigarette and the misunderstanding gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. It's a and miscommunication to, with the cells. Yes, until you think you can't stop. Yeah. But you can. You just have to realize you're just having misunderstanding and, and just stop buying them, stop lighting them, yeah. stop having that foolishness that the big tobacco has sold you on. Mm-hmm. Well, think about all the things in history that happened over a misunderstanding. I mean, yes. yeah, there's some stories about the Sicilian mafia getting started because somebody was missing a pig. Is it? Yeah, and then the same thing with the feuds with the Hatfields and the McCoys in the U.S. Oh, yeah. Where somebody said their chicken was missing, and all of a sudden, over a chicken, there was mad murder and all kinds of death. Mm -hmm. it's all about how Generations. Memory, right, generations. And it's all about how the memory colors in the parts that aren't there. They make up yeah. stuff that didn't yeah. happen. It's true. You know, yeah. so it's a matter of, like I was saying earlier, forgive it, release it, reset yourself, go out and live your life. Yes. All the things we're walking around carrying on our backs, why? What mm. What is that doing for anybody? If it was making you wealthy or better looking and younger, maybe, you know, <laughs> it might be worth it. But, of course, it doesn't do those things. Yeah. So maybe it's time to get moving in our lives and live a better dream. Mm -hmm. Instead you know I mean? of a nightmare. Yeah. Yes. Well, hypnosis and that's pain, itself. too. I mean, if you want to wrap it back around to what this call originally was about, was about pain. And that trauma that we create with the stories is where a lot of pain comes from mm -hmm. because we decide that we can't run away from it and we can't get away from it. And so it becomes pain. And then we just level more and more stuff on top of it. And we just end up with more and more pain. If we can unlevel it, unload it, forgive it, forget it, then the pain often goes away. Yes. Or well, we identify I, beyond it. Yes. Because we, people put yeah. themselves in that misery and say, this misery is who I am. No, right. no beautiful child of God. Yeah. If you take a human body to a physicist, you're compressed light is what you are. Yes. So the light that is the universe is compressed into mm. you. All universal stuff is making up your body. Your body is the stuff the universe is made out of. Mm -hmm. But your it's essence is way will. beyond anything like that. So tap into the empowered aspect of your essence and all changes take place. It has to mm -hmm. because you are that powerful. Everybody is that powerful. That's right. It's mind blowing to me how it, disempowered people feel. And I can remember coming to these conclusions after years of my life where I felt disempowered. Right. So it's not like I'm not walking the walk and talking the talk. I've been through this. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I, so I understand it. I've been through a lot of crazy things living through uh, my life in New York. I've had guns pulled at me, knives. I know what it is to starve. You know, there was moments when my parents got divorced. I know a lot of the things that people have gone through because I've lived them myself. Right. And yet, here I am, still here. We're all doing I, our life mission if it throws us back. I've been through some funny stuff. Yesterday evening, I was run over by a car on the pavement, the sidewalk. Wow. And um, he, 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 he drove onto the pavement and ran me over. And this is in the exact same spot that I was run over on the sidewalk by a car back in June. Wow. And, um, Stay off that sidewalk. Yeah. Don't he walk there. there anymore. And it, they, <laughs> they, um, the last time it, they, they, they drove up from behind, so I didn't see him. But this time he, he drove up while I was facing him, looked in my eyes and, and then, then the guy jumped out of his car, and he and he was a tall black guy. He was this tall above me, and he's standing against my face like this, looking down on me. And and I'm 
and he wants to fight with me. And I'm, I'm looking up at him and, and saying, come on. And I, I, I use my hypnotic language and I said to him, come on, try to hit me. <laughs> and, and he didn't. And I was encouraging, come, come try to hit me, and, which, which means he's going to fail, doesn't it? Because this right, is a hypnotic yeah. language. And, um, and he didn't hit me. Wow. Was, was he on lot. PCP or something, Angel Dust or something? I don't know what he was on, but um, he, he deliberately ran me over with his car on the sidewalk. Um, where am I, am I supposed to walk in the roads now? Wow. And he he drove it onto the pavement, so there was no pavement left. There was his car there, and there was the wall here. And this is the second time on the same spot on the pavement where they got me last year. Keith Anthony, jetpack, just fly around. <laughs> That's you from now on. Uh, well, or you can look at those spots as empowerment spots that you survived death twice on those spots. It's a life lesson. Well, it, it's you not survived death numerous times. I, it's not the first time I've been hit by a car. Well, it's the second time, but I was hit by a car in 1978. Wow! And I didn't do so well because I, I, in actual fact, I was I was in hospital on. On um, what was it? A Friday. I was I was in hospital on Thursday because of an accident I had in 1978, and he's ordered me a, 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 another MRI because he was looking at my MRI that was done in 2019. I've got so much brain damage. He was looking at the MRI. He couldn't believe it was accurate, so he's ordered me another one. <laughs> he couldn't believe what he was seeing because he, he felt that I shouldn't even be breathing based on the MRI he was looking at. So he's ordered me another one. You need to see a cranial sacral therapist. Yeah, They'll put the, your, your head back in the right place and yeah. the cerebral spinal fluid will be able to travel so that you can heal your brain. Yeah, I, I don't know if you could fix the amount of brain damage I've got with cranial sacral therapy. It helps, though. It helps. It, 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 it might does. stop the headaches that I've got because I'm in constant There you go. Headaches. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's a funny old world, though, isn't it? It is. And we're all here in it together. Mm, and we're still here for some reason. And I'm still trying to levitate. I, I, I believe thoroughly that I can levitate, but I've, I'm still trying to do it. Yeah. One there's day it will happen. There's a town in Long Island called Levittown. I always wanted to do a <laughs> workshop there called Levitation in Levittown. <laughs> really? That would be great. Yeah. You, I'd you know, come. <laughs> you know people who do it. And when they open the borders again, which I didn't know were completely closed, we get Keith either. Anthony over here too. Uh, yeah. And the next thing, if I if I can learn how to levitate, the next thing I want to do is to walk through walls. Oh, without injury, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> That's really nothing. You just need to phase into a higher level of existence slightly. You're yeah. in a white body. Now, I've I've seen people walking through walls, but but I think they were ghosts. I think maybe, I've had the same experience, and they yeah. were ghosts. Yeah, and it, it doesn't scare me. Well, I do find it very unusual when I, I – you've, you've seen weird things, haven't you, John? I remember you telling me last time we talked. Yeah, I have. A lot of times I don't talk about that on such broadcasts as we're doing right now. But, yes, I've had a lot of paranormal things happen to me over the years. Yep. Me too. I've seen things flying in the air. I've seen things flying in the air that defy the way we normally think of aircraft. Yeah, me too. Um, many times. Mm. And people around me see these things too sometimes. Yep. I've seen other things that are suddenly there, and then the person next to me sees them, and she's screaming and yelling, what is that? And then it fades away. Yeah. You know, I've been through a lot of weird things like that, too. But I think that's part of what draws us to being of the healing hypnotist that we are, I think. I think so. There are things that put us on this path, and some of these other things are kind of reminders to us of who we are. Yep. Yeah. And what we're doing here. And, you know, like there were times early in my career where, my father at the time was alive back then. How are you going to make a living at that, this? And, you know, you'd like to get up later in the day and work into the night. And I said to him, he said, well, how are you going to make money doing that? I said, you're a policeman. You do that. Night he shift. Told me to shut up. He told me to shut up because we had no answers. The answer I got was shut up. But yeah. um, I said, you're making a living getting up later in the day. I don't see what the problem is, you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, there were certain things that when I've tried to move over here, life goes and the higher power in the universe goes, no, 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 over here. Mm. No, I'm going to go over here. No, no, no. You're going back over there. Yeah. I really want. No, no. You don't. You want to go over here. This is what's going to make you happy. <laughs> go over here. Yeah. So, well, 
It's like going down to the river. You tie a wet rope around your waist and you say, now I'm at point A with you. I'm going to go to point B. And if I give you the signal and the water is too strong, you pull me in. So day after day, we can't get you to point B. And then one day the rope snaps and you're down at point C, which is where you should have been in the first place. Mm. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a wonderful world. I, I, I remember yeah. once I was I was speaking and saying funny things. I, I, when I was, uh, I think I was about 14, I was in some underground tunnels that, that were built during the war. Mm. And, and we, we, being kids, we managed to get into these places that we weren't supposed to be in. And we were in there with torches. And I, I had a, a friend standing alongside me from, from school. And so he witnessed it. And I, I saw coming along this tunnel, this big green glow. <laughs> uh, it was about that big. And it was on the floor and it was coming towards me. And, and it amazes me to this day that I wasn't frightened by this big green glow, and it was coming towards me along the floor, floating. Well, it was rolling, I suppose, along the floor. And it came right up to my feet, and then it, then it stopped, and then it moved sideways and dissolved into the wall. And I turned to my friend and I said to him, did, did you see that? And he said, yes, and I asked him to describe it. He said it was green glow. It came right up to your feet. Then it dissolved into the wall. So I, I, I know that I didn't imagine it, and to this day I don't know what it was, except that it was green and glowing. It was bright fluorescent green, mm. and um, don't know what it was. I'd like to know though. You probably. I always believe that after you die, all the things that you didn't know here are explained to you. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd be walking around in eternity going, what was that about? I, nobody ever told me. I still don't know. <laughs> so I think I think after you're dead, maybe some of this stuff gets explained to you. That's personally my theory. There's no cooperating evidence. But you know. well, when, when, when I was up there, when I had my near-death experience, what I found was that I, I, um, anything I asked a question about was answered. Mm -hmm. And anything, anything I thought appeared, and yeah. so if if you thought flowers, they they would appear to you, and if you thought about your ancestors, they would come to you, mm -hmm. and and I I seemed to know everything that there was to know. You could say I was a knoll, and there 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 were no secrets to me when I was up there, right. and and it always frustrates me that now that I've come back, apart from that little bit of knowledge, I my mind was wiped and they, you know, they, they didn't give me the seat. They, they wouldn't let me bring back the secret of life or any right. of those things that you might want to ask me now. Right. And that frustrates me. So I'm, I'm thinking, why did they let me know all of that and not bring it back with me? What, There's what a thing um, that's called the plane of all knowledge and it's from transcendental meditation and yeah. you can meditate and you can get to that point where you can get all the answers. The problem is you can't bring them back. So, so you know that the answers exist. And in that moment, you're satisfied that you got the answers, but you won't remember what it is when you come back. So it sounds like you went through the plane of all knowledge. Yes. And really was, frustrating. And I, I, w I was aware while I was up there that I was uh, not it, it was strange that uh, that uh, I, f I find it difficult to talk about it, and it, and it was, um, and it was probably th it was in fact thirty seven years before I could talk about it at all w right. without becoming a blubbering mess. Sure, but um, I, I I was aware. I, I, I can't even think what I'm trying to say to you. I know I know what I want to say, but I, I can't put it into words. And right. that, that that is the mark of somebody who's had a genuine near death experience. Right. We, we we can't put it into words, which is why I which is why I sometimes doubt these people that write books about it, mm. because it's difficult to put it into words. Well, sometimes um, you have to assign words to that inner landscape that you don't know words for. So yeah. you can create words as long as you have a glossary or a dictionary in the back of what you've written, so that people have a greater understanding of what it is that you're talking about. Yeah, but I, I, I was aware while I was up there that I was a, a spirit body. Sure. But I, I, I found it confusing that as I looked at myself, and I, I used the term looking at myself loosely because right. 
I've got eyes. I can't look at myself, can I? Except that I'm in the camera here. But <laughs> you can't. You can't pull your eyes out and look back, can you? But Not unless I, you're having an out of body experience I, I where you're floating on the ceiling and you're looking yeah. back down. I've done that For many sure. times. But I, I was. I was up there. I was a spirit body, okay. uh, but I was I was aware that I had a what appeared to be a physical body, and I'm think and I would remember thinking, what purpose is there for me to have this the physical body? I don't need it while I'm up there. Sure, sure. Which, which was a bit strange, uh, but but I was very much aware that I was a spirit body up there, and uh, I'm thinking, why why have they let me keep this physical body? I don't need it because it, it seemed to me that it was limiting my 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 um my movements up there but but that's mm. probably because i wasn't actually dead at that point but perhaps mm -hmm. if i had been dead they they would have taken that physical body away from me and i'd have had free movement up there probably there's mm. a phrase in hinduism that which is yet to be soiled by words oh so really? sometimes you have these experiences and because the words in our database of language do not exist or may never exist, or maybe don't exist yet. I don't know. Maybe there are some things you can't put words around. So be happy you had the experience. It fortifies you and inspires and strengthens you, and just be happy you went through it. Oh, I am. I would. Um, well, they thought I was nuts in hospital when I came out of the coma because I. I'm sure. Because I, I was, I was going because I was going through a lot of suffering in the hospital, but I, I said to them, I, I would not turn the clock back or erase it in any way. And they, they thought that I was mental. Well, a lot, a lot of people have always thought I'm mental. I, th I think I'm mental myself. Yeah. There and are I times. <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. Because that makes me what I am. We, right. we, I don't know. We've been going on for, or I've been, I've been going on for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> we all have. Mm -hmm. And, and I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed participating, and I really thank you for inviting us to be on this with you. Thank you. Had a great time. Thank you again. It's been great. Would would you both both of you, or either one of you, or both of you, like to give out any resources that you'd like to share, or your websites? Um, perhaps Dr. Connie will start with you because ladies first. Well, my website's right there at the bottom, so AmericasFertilityCoach.com. I also have hambrockholistichealing.com. And um, so there's lots of resources on both of those. So, so thank you. So do, if you're listening, make a note of that and get in touch with Dr. Honey Hambrook, America's Fertility Coach.com. And there the, you go. the other one was again, Dr. Honey? Hambrock, my last name, holistic with an H, H O L I S T I C, healing at or um dot com and dr connie has been practicing hypnosis since 1995 so she's got a lot of experience behind her I and recommended by by john sabone as well so that comes that comes with highly recommended yeah. so um I, i'm recommending her as well thank you and john sabone trance master your, your websites and books, would you like to mention them again? Sure. You can find me at hypnosisstageshow.com. That's right. I own that domain name. Hypnosisstageshow.com. My clinical site is Hypnotist Pro, P R O, as in professional. Hypnotistpro.com. My YouTube channel recently broke 3.3 million hits, which means somebody's watching and has one very sore finger if it's one person I'm clicking. <laughs> um, and we're going to be at HT Live, HT Live conference in Las Vegas. I'm proud of this project. There's six different versions of this, and um, this will be coming up. I, I realize TV is backwards. It takes a second to figure out the video on this. No, it looks but good. There's literally dozens and dozens of uh, self hypnosis MP3s. They're full length sessions uh, that I would be have done in person with people. And um, there's also some bonus features on there, including the best of the trance master, some of my stage stuff. Um, and I put a lot into this. Uh, on my website, there is a store. You can download or buy my books, either in electronic form or hard copy form. There are DVDs that are still available if you're still into DVDs. Um, and a lot of other resources on there for the average hypnotist. If you can join me in Las Vegas, if you're not traveling into a country that's locked down, 
or you can sneak through the border somehow to come visit this. <laughs> not that I'm, not, I'm not, nobody should break the law, but still, <laughs> I think the law is a little silly at this point, um, personally. Um, HT Live Conference is at the end of July into early August. Yep. Uh, I'm teaching the Galaxy of Hypnosis out there for four hours. Yay. And then I'm teaching an eight hour class. I will have a booth space, and the lovely Connie will be joining me as my sidekick, friend, colleague, and assistant. <laughs> um, and um, where we will be selling his MP3s, MP4s, t shirts, mugs, and clickers. 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 They're from, they, they, click, they have clicker devices. I have a lot of hypnotists who tell me they can't do this. I, I was thinking that myself because I, 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 that's as loud as I can click my fingers. I'm hopeless. Yep, me too. That's why I suggested that we have them because he's going to be teaching a class on rapid induction. And if you can't snap your fingers very well, then it doesn't work as well. But if you've got a clicker and it goes click, 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 then you can do it better. This this hand doesn't do it at all because this hand was paralyzed when I had my accident. I, I can't can't do it at all with this hand. My hand was never paralyzed hand and I still can't do it. So. My left hand is useless for this. I had surgery on this thumb as a child. Mm. Uh, why, why was your left hand paralyzed, Doctor Connie? I don't. I don't know. Mine wasn't paralyzed. So I just can't do it. Oh, I, th I thought you said it was right. No, no, that was That's John. Me. John said he can't do it with his. Maybe his you can get lessons on finger clicking. <laughs> this hand well, should be registered with Lloyd's of London for you know insurance purposes. It's so good. <laughs> this hand totally a waste of time. <laughs> but sometimes if I'm doing an induction, I'll go like that because it looks like you're doing both hands at the same time. But this um, one has no volume. Yeah. I, I just say to my people, look, just go into trance or I'm going to slap you. Oh. No, I There's don't. A, I, good. I don't a book. This hypnotist who wrote a book called Sleep You So-and-So. I won't use that word on such a nice, clean broadcast, but it, it alludes to the illegitimacy of somebody's birth. So mm -hmm. you use your own word there, figure out what it means. But it's Sleep You So-and-so. And I've think I, I I've never read that book, but I've seen the title of it. I think it's a fantastic idea. For a title for a hypnotist to write a book about. Wow. <laughs> Incredible. <Steep>. That's it. <laughs> and by the way, just in case anybody went out watching that, let's bring them back. <laughs> and you're back. Them. You're back. Yeah, I'm really drooling over the keyboard. Or who, I've got one of my friends who goes into trance every time I wave my blue pen at her on screen. Aww. And I set that anchor in 2011. Wow. But she still, she still goes immediately into trance if I wave my blue pen on the screen, just just like this, and she goes in. The technique <laughs> I learned great. from John. I still have people laughing at my red pen from over 25 years ago when I came up with that. Mm. So That's another thing he's going to have. He's going to have red pencils that he's going to be giving away to people that are in his show. Yeah, I, I get the blue pen out now, but but the, the person concerned might watch this video, in which case she'd go into trance, so I won't, so I won't do that. Blue pen? <laughs> oh, you put her into trance now. <laughs> My funny, funny red pen. That's right. Mm. And sleep. This has been a true delight. Thank you for having us. Yes. Absolutely. And we'd be glad to do it again anytime. Just that ask would, us and if lovely. we're available. Oh. So with that, I thank the audience for, for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. And I, I have been um, Keith Anthony Taylor. This has been hypnotist John Sabone, Dr. Connie Hambrook, the American Fertility Coach .com. If you want to contact me for sessions, by the way, I, I am available at hypnosensei.co.uk. And you can also find me on my Facebook, which is facebook.com forward slash hypnosensei. And cool. you can always phone me on my London number, which is 44, the international code, and 208-664-9595. And I do sessions over Zoom and, and also StreamYard, which is pretty much the same thing. And so um, you've been listening to London Overcomers Real Pain. I hope you've enjoyed the show. And do share this um video with your friends so they get my numbers up so thank you very much for listening <laughs> have a great weekend and i'm going to say bye bye for now and, <laughs> and john 
And Connie, if, if you stay in the studio for a moment too, so I can thank you when no I problem. end the broadcast, which is going to be right now. So bye-bye, everybody, for now.